Hello everyone, welcome to the video. I'm so glad that you are here. If you have a seat belt, I will need for you to tighten it up. I have a most difficult passage of scripture that I'm going to share with you, and so I want you to sit tight. I want you to focus, ask God to give you a spirit of humility if you need it. I needed it as I was writing this article out for you. I'm going to share with you one of the toughest mandates that Christ has given us in the entire New Testament. By the way, if you are watching this video on YouTube or Rumble, those are two of our platforms, and haven't subscribed, if you would subscribe to those platforms, it will help us to reach more people with the practical message of Christ, and that is the goal. What we do in our ministry is that we focus on sanctification, and so how to apply theology practically because that really speaks to all of our lives because we struggle personally, we struggle relationally, we have all kinds of issues and so our message, our mission is to help people by sharing the practical message of Christ which I'm about to do here with this video. By the way, if you do benefit from this ministry and have the ability to support us financially, Will you do that? I know everybody can't do that, and so I don't want you to feel any guilt whatsoever. But we did make a commitment a number of years ago that we're just going to give it away. We're going to give the house away, and we're going to trust that God would move hearts and that people will want to support us, $5, $10 a month, whatever they can give or donate one time. Now, I know that you subscribe to many things and you support and your church is most important, of course. And so, again, I don't want you to feel any pressure, but I did want to put it out there so that you know that we do need your support financially. There are 10 of us that work in this ministry. We are a minimalistic ministry. We take five loaves and two fishes and really God does a remarkable work and, and the 10 of us, we're all virtual assistants. We're VAs. And what I mean by that is that we do not have an office. We, I built this ministry by design uh, with that in mind that we would do take a minimalistic approach. And that really helps with the overhead. Uh, it's not that expensive to operate this ministry, but there are expenses and we can't do it without you because our business model is primarily we give our product away and so we trust that God would move hearts and so if you're able to do that I uh, would really appreciate it. Now again no guilt whatsoever. Do you have your seat belt buckled? If you do let's jump into this most challenging mandate from our leader. Roll through your mental index, and I want you to identify the kind of person or maybe the people group that you do not prefer. Those people that you might typically avoid. And so when you're in the Walmart and you see that person coming, you may take a hard right uh, to get out of their way because you really don't want to engage them. They do things that you don't like. Maybe their attitude, their mannerisms, their behavior, their worldview, or just simply fill in the blank. But whatever it is, it's just not your cup of tea. Perhaps it's something that your spouse or child or parent or church member does. Maybe it's that Christian hypocrite who needs to just get a life. Or someone who has different strengths and different weaknesses from yours. But do you have that person in your mind? You have rolled through your mental index and somebody's picture has popped up. You have them in view. If you have that annoying person in mind, then we're ready to proceed. And the way that I want to proceed in this podcast is by applying the Lord's mandate, love your enemy. Hello everyone, this is Rick Thomas. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Life Over Coffee. We have two types of Life Over Coffee podcasts. We have one where I share an article that I have written for you, which is what I'm going to do here. And then also I do topical Life Over Coffee podcasts where it's not a written out article, but it is a topic, it's a subject that's important to you. And I have a skeletal outline, we call them show notes in the podcast business. So I do either one of those, but that is our Life Over Coffee podcast. Now, by the way, if you have a topic that you would like for me to cover, if you would just send an email 
and say, hey, Rick, if you haven't covered this subject yet, would you talk about this? And if it pertains to life and godliness, if it is a way that we can communicate the practical message of Christ in such a way that it impacts our lives, that's a subject that is important to you that would have application to many other people, just send an email and ask Sharon, one of our VAs, ask Sharon if she would uh, get it over to me and I would love to consider it. I'll do an entire podcast possibly on your topic, so I want you to know that. But in this particular Life Over Coffee episode, the title of it is Pick an Enemy. Will you do what Jesus said? Love them. Now, you can read, watch, or listen to this resource. We develop our resources this way, so you can choose your poison. So if you want to read it, I have a 2,000-word article here for you. If you want to watch it, there is a video. This video is on YouTube. It is on Rumble, but you can also watch it inside the article here on our website. Just go to our website. And you will find all three of these resources in one spot. So you can read, watch, or listen. And of course, the podcast is embedded inside the article as well. If you are able, I would love for you to share this with uh, someone and let them know. Maybe you can share this article with your enemy. That would be a great idea, possibly, maybe. Uh, But you share it with someone and say, hey, I want you to listen to this or watch the video. I want you to read the article that this is very powerful, and I think it would not just uh, help you. It has helped me, too, and if you share that with someone, I would really appreciate it. All right, so let me jump into this. Again, the title of this resource is Pick an Enemy. Will you do what Jesus said? Love them. Now, perhaps the word enemy might sound too strong because we are a postmodern culture, and when Jesus talked, uh, he He did not talk to snowflakes, and he used strong biblical language, and I do think that is the best way to communicate. But unfortunately, we're so far removed, not just 2,000 years, uh, but the way that we communicate to each other has been so tamped down and Uh, that we're afraid to talk with the clarity of God's Word. And maybe the word enemy uh, might be too strong for you, but most assuredly, whoever this person is that you have in your mind, that individual is not your bestie, okay? And so let's just put them in one or two categories, love or hate, bestie or or not bestie. I mean, we can tone it down a bit. I mean, as long as you're honest with your thoughts about the person that you have in mind. Maybe you prefer the word annoying better than the word enemy. Okay, that's that's fine. But also, as you think about this person in your mental index, make sure that you don't forget the folks in your home as well. You see, disliking somebody outside your family or disliking somebody in cyberspace, quite honestly, that's easier to do because that is more risk-free. I mean, you could even unfriend them on social media and there's no risk and there's no tension there. You can just walk away from it. And so again, maybe the person that you have in mind is living within your four walls. But as you think about that person, I want you to reflect on this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 48. You're familiar with it. This is Jesus talking. He said this, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Jesus is throwing down right now. He is name calling. He said, if you can't do this, you are a tax collector or about the same as a tax collector. And if you contextualize what he's saying here, it's a pretty strong insult. He goes on to say, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. So he's leveraging some comparisons here to motivate his audience to think about this necessity of not just loving your enemies, but praying for them as well. Now, I would say that there is a, there's a, there's something embedded here that's implied. If you can pray for your enemies, uh, that will move you toward loving them. 
And so as God rings the gospel bell in your heart, meaning you want to you want to model the gospel. Christ, our first missionary, went to enemies, you and me, and he loved us. And so as God rings this gospel bell in your heart, the question is whether the sound is in tune with his heart. Are you on the same page? If you're unsure, there is one other assessment that you can make. It is this. When you think of that person, does your heart first feel pity toward that enemy or something more like frustration and disdain. Now, when I say pity, I, I don't mean I pity that person so glad I am not like them. I'm asking something different. Are you heartbroken? That's what I mean by pity. Are you heartbroken for them? In the vein of Paul's warning in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, where he said, what what have you received that was not first given to you? Anything that we have, any gift, any blessing, uh, any temptation to superiority, well, actually, it was a gift that was given to us. And so we do not have permission to elevate ourselves as being morally superior or intellectually superior or any other kind of superiority that we want to take on. We can't elevate ourselves and look down on others like a tax collector and thumping our breast and saying, God, thank you that I'm not like them. And so when I say pity, I'm not talking about that superiority attitude, but I'm talking about a person who is heartbroken, heartbroken because they are, they are not in that place of maturity and grace uh, where you are. Now, there are two primary groups of people who struggle with obeying the love your enemies mandate. People who have a hard time loving others did not just get there. And when you start thinking about people who struggle the most with what Jesus is asking us to do, you're going to find two primary demographics. Those who have experienced legitimate hurt or abuse or pain or suffering from someone. That is one demographic, and they have a hard time. When they hear this passage of Scripture, the gospel bell might not go off, or it may have a clucking sound to it. And then there is another group of people, people who have been shaped by others, either through Adamic fallenness, or they have been enculturated by the biases of others. They have been trained to hate people. And so those are the two demographics who struggle with what Jesus is asking here. Those who have, are suffering at the hands of others or, or who have suffered, and then those who have been shaped by Adamic fallenness, as we all have, and then also shaped by the culture. They have been enculturated to hate other people. Now, all of us fit into one of those camps, and maybe most of us fit into to both of those. But I want to take the first group first. Those who have been hurt. Hurt souls that they need the Lord's grace to help them to walk through their genuine, their objective, and painfully memorable past. Something has happened to them. Somebody has done something to them. I would be in this camp, no question about it. I won't get into my story in this podcast, but I've talked a lot about it. And if you want to chat about it, by the way, you can jump on our forums. I'll be glad to talk talk about it with you. But let's just say it was a horrible past and there was a lot of suffering at the hands of some very mean people. Now, it's these people here, it's, it's not that they lack the Lord's truth. They know they should love their enemies. They have heard this message before. But the problem is, is that the pain was real, real in the moment, and also residual. You see, suffering has legs, and you cannot quickly get to a mature biblical frame of mind. It takes time. And so if you're talking to this individual who has been hurt by another person, you want to be careful as you ease them up to the starting gate so that they can get into place to where they can really mount up as eagles. Bringing these suffering souls to the heights of what Jesus was talking about regarding an enemy, it's not something for the careless counselor or the careless disciple maker to attempt. Some people do need a long runway before they can soar with those eagles. 
You see a snapshot of this in Paul's preamble in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians specifically. Before he trucked the challenging truth over to his enemies, before he began talking to his enemies, he was very careful to assure them that he had affection for them. The implication is quite clear in the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians. Paul had already worked through what those mean enemies had done to him. Now that is the attitude that we want to have and that is the attitude that we want to convey. And I think when we're conveying affection for those who have hurt us, then we're at the place where we are imitating what Jesus is asking us to do to love our enemies. And so the first demographic that has a hard time with this are those who have been legitimately hurt by others. And then the second group are the enculturated. Now, we're either enculturated by Adamic fallenness, which means all of us were born to hate people, but then we, are, we can also be shaped to hate people too, depending on our life context and situation. Encultured is the effect of being affected by historical or modern norms outside biblical worldviews and assumptions. We have been shaped by modern norms or historical norms that are outside biblical boundaries. Many believers believe things that the culture promotes, but the Bible denounces. They have been shaped, and that makes it hard for them to love enemies. They have enemies because of how they have been shaped. For example, critical race theory is one of the most common things that we have in our culture today where many believers are being enculturated into this heinous doctrine. The enculturated group needs the Lord's truth to see how their sinfulness obscures the gospel's love and power, their need to love their enemies. My point here is that any Adamic person can hate another image bearer. We all have been shaped, maybe not so much by the culture, but definitely by Adam. And though our enemies need grace, and though our enemies should receive it, the enculturated are blind to the lies, and they need careful, courageous, and competent exposure to God's impeccable word so they can get to the place of loving their enemies. Adamic fallenness is complicated enough, but when you add enculturated layers on top of it, you're not far from a case-hardening effect that will dull the conscience and it will create, it will maintain those barriers between the enculturated and the enemies that they should love. And then you add a prejudice or you add a bias to their Adamic fallenness, well, it does amp up the blindness. I mean, for example, my father was a white-hot racist. Though he did not evangelize us into his bigotry, we knew where he stood. Now, mercifully, I'm not aware of any of his children succumbing to his racist venom. But the same thing happens in black homes, too, or any home where prejudice is a part of the unique fallenness of that unique family. Of course, the problem of enculturation, it does not have to be about melanin. It doesn't have to be about racism. We can hate anyone. And so we want to be careful because we're so exposed to the culture, more exposed than any generation prior to us has been exposed because the world is so much smaller now through social media. And so it is easier to be enculturated with hate. And so when talking to the victim of enemies, those who are suffering, or the enculturated ones, the issue is, is how we govern our hearts. The most tempting lever to pull when we pour out our hatred typically has truth written on that, on that lever. We can take a morally superior position, either because of our self-righteousness, because we've been trained that way by our culture, or because of what the, that person did to us, we can look down on them with a moral superiority. And so we yank that handle of truth and we spill our righteousness over onto them because God's word says so. Amen. A few of these quick trigger truth tellers have social platforms in addition to church contexts that are susceptible to our pontifications. Jesus was the perfect example of a person who knew whether to lead with grace or truth while never holding back either one. And that is the balance that we want to maintain. 
for those who have a superior attitude toward others or an enculturated attitude that is superior in their own minds toward others. They will just fling the truth out and there will be no grace. But Jesus is our perfect example of a person who could do that. Sometimes we must overlook a few things in those annoying people. We hold back the truth while modeling a profound other-centered love for them. The issue here is not about withholding the truth, but whether or not we have accomplished the prerequisite heart work inside of us to make sure that we're leading with the right need for the recipients of our care. As challenging as speaking the truth is at times, it is harder to govern our hearts with love before we talk, especially if that person is annoying. And so the big idea here is not whether it is grace or truth, those things are important, but how is our heart governed by a genuine love for our enemies? The key to loving those who disappoint us is whether we're willing to set aside what we want right now for a greater good that might not be our expected outcome. To set aside is yet another beautiful facet of the gospel. The Lord Jesus, who was God, chose to place his godness aside so that he could come to earth as a human to save us. Christ the offended power penetrated the enemy's camp to rescue those evil doers, you and me. We will have to decide if we will love those who are unlovable, like we were before Christ penetrated our dark souls with the gospel. The most vital question is if we're going to live out the gospel to a fallen image bearer. Gospel work is for the humble, courageous soul. As you already sense as you're listening to this or watching this, the need to arrest our hearts and examine our affection for a fellow image bearer is the first and most crucial examination that we can make. Sometimes the disappointing people in our lives can weigh so heavy that we never see the crouching lion of frustration ready to pounce. The first place folks typically discern this problem is in their tone, the way that we communicate, how it sounds to other people. When that difficult person annoys us, that tone comes out, and that tone should be a clue as to whether we have affection for them or not. And many times the tone is a dead giveaway that our hearts are not in the right place and we should not be speaking at this point. Because of the difficulty of the task and our lack of human ability to accomplish the love your enemy mandate, we must take ourselves back to our example. Christ. Jesus would not withhold the truth from us, but it would not come out of an annoyed heart. Perhaps it would be wise to consider confessing our sinfulness to the annoying person before we correct them. Now let me give you a big caveat here. I don't recommend this all the time. Uh, there are some people who have hurt you. If you're, if you're in that place to where you have been damaged by someone, then you shouldn't go to them and confess anything. That's not what I am saying here. But in normal relational conflict I'm talking about here, not the, the amplified, aggravated relational conflict that is in the realm of abuse and maybe even crimes like molestation. And so I don't recommend this all the time, but it could prove helpful depending on the situation. If genuine brokenness does not govern a sinful attitude. For example, there have been many occasions when a family member was sinful to me. They initiated uh, they, they were first to shoot across the bow some sinful thing. But my reaction to them, my response to them was sinful. Rather than starting with them, my enemy in this moment, I began with myself, demanding to change me first. 
You could say something like this to get things started. Quote, I have had an angry heart toward you, and I'm asking if you will forgive me. Will you forgive me? We could talk later about their role in the relational dust-up. But the most important thing, like Paul to the Corinthians, getting his heart ready by growing in an affection for his enemies before he started talking to them. And in normal relational conflict, maybe that would be a good idea. The primary thing is to clean up our dust before vacuuming the other sinner's side of the room. When the most vital things in our lives are what we want, what we like, what we prefer, or what we bend toward, we will entangle ourselves in a blinding web. An example of this is the parent of a disobedient child. When the parent complicates the child's sin by sinning against the kid, it could also be the spouse who responds wrongly because they feel as though they are drowning in a marriage disappointment. Christ came into the world to save sinners which means in part he came to untangle fallen creatures from sin's entrapments. While the wayward child or the hurtful spouse should change, that kid and that spouse should change, neither one should have so much power over us that we sin in response to their failures. When this happens, we are succumbing to the first wave of idolatry. One of those idolatrous entrapments is when a desire, even a good one, begins supplanting what the Lord can do and can provide for us. Now, I know what I'm saying is hard to apply because I live in the same body as you, a fallen one. I'm not speaking to you as a disembodied flesh and blood humanoid who has no connection to Adam, Christ, or reality. I feel your pain, and I do, not, I do not say that sarcastically at all. This idea about loving your enemy was not something that I made up, but an imperative that Jesus gave with the expectation that his followers apply it. And I'm one of those fallen followers. The gospel empowers us to do many things after our regeneration. I want you to press into the call to action in this podcast. I'm about to share it with you. I want you to press into this call to action while asking the Spirit of God to do whatever He needs to do to bring a few reasonable changes to your life and relationships. And so I want to go back through the three themes that I laid out for you. Loving your enemy, setting aside, speaking the truth. Those were the three things that I talked about. Enemy, loving, setting aside as Christ did, and then speaking the truth. That is the order. And so here's the call to action. Here are the questions and the ideas I want you to think about as you apply this passage. Enemy, loving, point number one. What is your genuine heart of heart attitude toward the person you thought about when I ask you to pick an enemy from your mental index. What is your genuine heart of heart attitude? Think about what I'm asking as a spectrum. If hate was on one end and love was on the other, where would you land with this person? Now remember, there is nothing that a person can do to stop you from loving them. Even if you reduce your love for them to sadness because of their lack of change. That is a form of love. That's the pity that I was talking about earlier. Though they may never love you in return, they cannot stop you from biblically loving them regard, no matter what that love may look like. And so point number one, loving your enemy. What is your heart of heart attitude toward that person? Number two, setting aside. What desires do you need to set aside to be Jesus to that person? I'm not suggesting that you will ever experience reconciliation or that you will ever be best buddies. I'm not talking about that. You may never have a relationship with them. Loving your enemies does not mean your enemies will change. Loving your enemies does not mean that your enemies will reconcile with you. I trust that you have a broader definition and application for love. My questions are less about reconciliation and more about being Jesus to someone, setting aside your desires. And then number three, speaking truth. 
you have examined your heart of heart attitude toward them. You're setting aside what you want. Are you ready to speak the truth with love? How do you know? When you're living out the previous two aspects of enemy loving and setting aside, you might be ready to talk about the truth in love. And you're going to mess up. You're going to mess up what you say if you do not authentically love the person while setting aside your desires. If you do not have an authentic affection for them and you're setting, not setting aside your desires, no matter how hard you try to make it work or to mask your disappointment, you will not be able to do it. You can't fake legitimate hurt. And when it lingers too long in the heart, sin will cling to the walls and eventually take over your mind and it will come out in your tone. I want to wrap up by sharing a prayer uh, that you can get. It's at the bottom of this article here. And by the way, the title of the article is Pick an Enemy. Will you do what Jesus said? Love them. Here's the prayer. Dear Spirit of God, will you help me honestly, transparently, and humbly work through these questions in this call to action? Will you give me the grace and courage to address my heart the way it needs addressing? Will you change me? I want to be a balanced Christian who speaks the truth in love, but first I need a heart change. As I read this passage from Jesus, will you show me what I need to do? Will you lead me to someone who can help me? Will you help me? Make what Peter said real to me in 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it you endure, but if when you do good and suffer for it you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Christ committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That is the prayer. The article is, pick an enemy. Will you do what Jesus said? Love them. 